Good. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shihab Ramid. I'm a restorative consultant and I'm the director of London Dental Academy. I'm very pleased to introduce today at, for you one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Sivash. Um, he's a specialist prosthodontist, um, finished his training at uh, the Eastman Dental Institute. And prior to that, he also had a, the membership of the Royal College of uh, Surgeons. And also he had the MPIN Dent along with the MRD in prosthodontics. Uh, I knew Sivash for the last uh, 12 years. Last time we met, I think about, was 10 years ago, Sivash? A long time, long time. Yeah, 11 years. He was very passionate about having his special training in prosthodontics. Of course, I gave him some encouragement that time and he made it at the end. It was a tough time, I'm sure, Sivash, at the Eastman to do some training. But here it's you go mistake. now, you are... Uh, especially within, well within your rights. And um, thank you very much for coming along with the initiative of um, giving lecture about partial dentures. Uh, guys, just to give you uh, some background, partial dentures in one of the important topics in dentistry, and unfortunately being overlooked nowadays by the implant subjects and more cosmetic type dentistry, but the fundamental, the backbone of dentistry is prosthodontics basically. And partial dentures is one of these important topics. I tell you why. Every patient coming through the door, they have got some missing teeth. And some of these teeth could be uh, having like tooth wear, loss of um, tooth structure, um, lack of posterior support. Uh, most often you see it in tooth wear cases and cases when you've got splaying tooth mobility. And also for people who need implants sometimes, you come in with, they come with multiple teeth missing and we don't know where to start from. So having a knowledge about the design of partial dentures in terms of retention, stability, support is key. And also managing complex cases, from my point of view, if you've got somebody with severe tooth wear, you can't start, you can't deliver successful treatment in the long term without having enough support or having tooth replacement at the same time. Let alone the fact that dental implants as well, to start with, you need a prototype and the prototype will start from partial denture. And believe it or not, some of the people would be happy by having partial denture, especially if their surgery is quite complex, they can't afford the treatment. So from your point of view, mastering the skill and the art of partial denture is a key. And also on the top of that, having the skills to deliver um, predictable and uh, good quality partial denture is good from financial point of view as well, because you will improve your revenue. Yet it's safe, it's reversible, it's low risk, and it does improve the quality of life for patients. Uh, and this is evidence-based through the research in the last 30 or 40 years. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Sivash Mashuf to start his lecture on the tips for GDPs on partial denture. Uh, you can start, Dr. Sivash. Thank you very much, Shahab, uh, for having me. And thank you, everyone. I'm quite flattered by the turnout. I wasn't expecting um, uh, such uh, such interest in this topic because it's traditionally seen by some as a dry topic but I'm, I'm hoping to spruce it all up for you and make you guys really interested in you know getting cracking with some of these partial denture cases with interest and with excitement. Can I just ask a question before I start Shehab? If I hover my cursor here, can you see it? I think you muted yourself. Yes, we can. We can see it? Yep, fantastic. Right, let's move on. So um, here we go. So learning objectives for today, quickly, uh, just so we gauge what we're going to be discussing. Uh, generally, it's quite broad to improve um, GDPs, but also specialists in uh, you know, restorative prosthodontists can listen to this talk as well, of course, to improve our knowledge in partial dentures generally. Uh, understanding um, how to design, having some concepts in our mind that can uh, you know, increase, uh, you know, better our design work, understanding different strategies, and also um, looking a little bit at the fixed removable interface. Right, um, I do, I, I'm not the kind of talk, I don't know what kind of webinars you're used to, but I, I'm not the type that likes to uh, just do a monologue. I do like a bit of interaction, it's much easier in person, but you've got that chat screen on your, um, you know, uh, in front of you. If you don't have it, if you just hover up at the top, this is where the demonstration goes wrong. If you hover at the top, normally it drops down uh, and you can click on more or something and it says chat. Open your chat screens. I do want some input from you. And the first question I want to ask you just to chat quickly on your screens is why do you think Chromes are better 
than acrylic dentures? Why do you think they're more of an appropriate uh, treatment option long term than acrylic dentures? Um, if anyone can just I'm type sorry. away and think okay. about what it may be about chromes that might, you know, better fit. Yep, perhaps. Okay. Uh, thinner, stronger. Yep, so better fracture resistance, less likely to break. Patients prefer hy hygienic. <laughs> I like that, um, definitely. There's something everyone's missing, and I think it's the key point. Everything is true. Rigidity, absolutely, it doesn't sink. Too supported. Thank you very much. Someone just said too supported, and that, 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 that's really the main, uh, the main thing behind, uh, uh, well, I'm getting absolutely blasted now of answers, but they're all correct. Improved retention, hygienic, tooth point. The, the key issue I want you all to remember from the picture you can see, is too supported. So if we, here's my list that I made and perhaps you may have said something that I haven't mentioned. Too supported is top of the list for the reason someone said in the chat box that as we load our dentures, if we have a mucosa supported denture, all the load is directed into the gingivae and the ridge. And the ridge is not designed to take that kind of load. Teeth are designed to take load and not the ridges and, and, and the underlying alveolar bone, which will therefore resorb. And it's going to resort much slower if there are less forces directed to it and the forces are transmitted through the teeth so tooth support is a key thing um, less flexure so rigidity more versatile we can design it and put more you know, different you know, different principles in in place retention for example support stability less bulky as you know acrylic um, requires to be much thicker in terms of to have the adequate bulk so it doesn't fracture. Uh, and cobalt chrome can be much thinner, of course. More hygienic. Something people didn't mention is that it conducts heat. So um, if you imagine having a full coverage of your palate, imagine if you had a complete denture, plastic, and you drink a cup of tea um, uh, or coffee, you know, you, you, you can only imagine what that might feel like or not feel like. And at least having metal um, will conduct some of that a little bit more. So you can arguably say it can improve your quality of life because eating is a, you know, it's, it's an important aspect of quality of life. I'm really sorry about this red line that's at the bottom. I thought it's only in that slide. I have no idea why it's there. No idea how to get rid of it. Longevity is the other thing. And that's a picture top right hand side that's missing. And that's this denture here. If it shows up. This is one of my patients I saw. Uh, I saw this patient three years ago, but I see him routinely. And this picture I took three years ago of his denture he had, he had since um, 1969, still servicing, still working in his mouth. And uh, okay, it's been repaired, it's been, you know, it's had work done on it, it doesn't fit great, but it survived for, you know, 40 years, 50 years. So, um, so, so I think we, I think we have to understand longevity of cobalt chromes way outweigh the longevity of acrylics and therefore cost benefit. You know, you pay more, a little bit more for a, a chrome denture, but look at all the advantages and you probably have to pay for three or four uh, acrylics. Um, by the time you get to the, I mean, but you'll get through, sorry, about three or four acrylics by the time you get through, uh, through the lifespan of, 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 an, of a chrome denture. And so um, for that reason, I mean, it's a no brainer. And generally, I like to think of acrylic dentures more as provisional uh, rather than definitives. I like to push patients towards having chromes for all the advantages mentioned here. Moving on, this is a topic that a lot of people do discuss, and that's uh, Valplast. Now, normally when I present this, I, um, I open the discussion to the floor and say, what do you all think about Valplast? But I don't really have that ability now. But, um, but Valplast is something that a lot of dentists do and a lot of dentists are interested in. And I got this quote from their website. Um, and, and, and if you look at it, the quote is quite attractive. And um, without scrutinizing and getting into the science behind it, you might be quite persuaded, and I think a lot of people are persuaded by it, that the flexible, flexible nylon resin acts as a, a, a built-in stress breaker. I mean, that's a buzzword there, built-in stress breaker, in order to provide superior function, another buzzword, and stress distribution, another buzzword, in removable partial dentures. This is all marketing. That's what it is, really. There's little science yet. In fact, in reality, the flexure and the and the and the stress distribution that they're talking about, which is the flexing, which you can see in the picture, is actually the reason why Valplast isn't what you want for your patients, rather than rather than the reason to have it for your patients. So their selling point is actually against them, not for them. And the reason and the reason is this: ultimately, if you look at this picture, it's a mucosa-supported 
denture. It's got all the disadvantages of mucosa and none of the advantages of tooth supported uh, prostheses. That's the first problem. The second problem is what I said about the selling point. As you load a flexible thing, it's going to flex obviously. And those f that flexing is not going to be axially on teeth. That flexing is not going to be vertical. It's going to flex laterally. And as it flexes laterally, it's gonna put horizontal forces, because there's no bracing really, horizontal forces on potentially mobile, periodontally involved teeth, compromised teeth, forces that posterior teeth are not generally designed to take lateral forces. They like to take vertical forces a lot more. And that's what your chrome gives you but not your Valplast. So personally, I haven't done the Valplast before. I don't intend to do one really. Perhaps I might be more open to one if it's got a cobalt chrome as a frame and then the acrylic work, if you like, or if the Valplast. But generally, I'm not an advocate of Valplast uh, for the reasons. I don't think they're healthy to use in the mouth long-term. Happy to accept questions later if that's stirred up a bit of controversy, but um, I think it's quite clear from the scientific basis. Now let's look a bit about support. I don't want to insult your intelligence and ask you what is support. Uh, we all know it's resisting movement into the tissue, but how can we achieve this? So I want you guys to get, get those idle fingers typing away. Uh, give me some reason, uh, give me some ways that we can achieve support um, using uh, in our dentures. Rest seats, yep, yep. So tooth support from the rests. Flange, so soft tissue, so there's mucosa and tooth support rests. Rest is the big one. So any other any other offerings? Rest seat, non-resorbable bone. So yeah, that's mucosa support, the non-resorbable bone. This would be the primary support area, like the palate in the maxilla, or the retromolar pads, or the or, and the buckle shelves of the lower, just like our partial den uh, our complete denture prosthodontics. Extension of the denture again, that's mucosa support. Surface area, that's the mucosa support. All correct, all right, um, no problem. Anything else? Think how else can we get support? I want you guys to think out of the box a little bit. Someone's mentioned saliva. Um, I I'm talking about support. Uh, saliva is more of an attribute for retention of complete dentures where the surface tension can help. That's perhaps not what we're looking at now. Guide planes, nice. That guide planes, I don't know if that's more for support. That's, that's perhaps later. Um, implant support, that's it, yeah. So, so, so here's a list here. Um, implant, yeah, let's not forget implants don't only give retention, implants give support. So we've got tooth support, which will be rests, precision attachments, which we'll look at a little bit later, telescopic copings, which we'll look at later as well, and implants, mucosa support. So we mentioned the palate, the retromolar pad, the buckle shelf, or both. And there's a class, Becker's classification is the name there. Now, this is where I want to get into a little bit of tips just to help uh, you guys when you're doing this kind of thing. I want you to look at these pictures here for occlusal rests. Um, and I want you to uh, look especially at the picture on the left hand side with the number two written next to it. If you look at the shape of that rest seat, if you can see my cursor, we on prepare rest seats maybe half a mil or one millimeter in thickness when we do. But I want you to notice that there's an, there's an additional dip. So just as you prep, you need to dip your bow a little bit further on, on the inner portion. Uh, of the rest seat preparation. And that's so that your rest seat can actually engage or grab hold of the tooth and properly load it axially because it's engaging properly. And um, so I think we need perhaps a, uh, a, a, a rounded diamond burr of some sort in order to do that. Um, another thing to look at is the dimensions of it. Generally speaking, and this is just general, there will always be exceptions. Generally, we use a rule of thirds. So if you look at the picture on the right, we like the buccopalatal and the mesiodistal um, dimensions of the, of the rest seat to be about a third um, of, of the two. So buccopalatally and meso, uh, mesiodistally. So that's an important picture. But there's another thing that a lot of people neglect uh, when they're preparing occlusal rest. So if you can remember the dip in this area that I mentioned and the general dimensions, assuming that the tooth is okay to have that, this is just the ideal scenario, but something a lot of people neglect, which causes the lab to always give them a call and say, we can't put a rest here, uh, and we can't put a class for this rest like you've requested. And that's the next picture to follow. Here, it's space, to, preparing space to allow your rest seat to actually uh, your clasp to, or your minor connector to come out from the rest seat. Now, a lot of times we make space for a rest seat like I illustrated, and then we want a clasp or a minor connector to come out of it, but the interdigitation of the teeth 
will not allow the space for something to come out of it. So we do have to prepare in these areas here, a little bit of the enamel and from a buckle uh, point of view, it's um, from a buckle perspective, it's just prepping that little corner there to create the space for the metal of your clasp where your minor connector to come away, to come through. I hope that's clear. It's quite an important thing a lot of people miss. Another thing, a way of getting tooth support is singulum rests. Um, using direct composites. We've got some other examples later. And these two pictures illustrate where really, for pretty much for all lower, uh, lower chromes that there are sound canines, I would like to get some tooth support from, from, the, uh, from these canines using a direct composite. You can see them illustrated there. And what I tend to do is I do that same principle I explained where you put a little dip. So when I use the, um, when I place my composite there, I have a little micro brush and I just push in this area just to create this little dip in this portion here. And you can just about see that in this diagram. It has, doesn't have to be too large. Um, I would probably spread the compass a little bit further down the tooth so you have more of a surface area. Um, but I think uh, direct composite as a single and rest is a fantastic way of getting tooth support in cases where you may struggle. Uh, this is a case, for example, where we might struggle for support and we very nicely got some predictable uh, single and rest seeds. Just make sure your lab knows that the metal from the chrome is supposed to cover over and into that rest seat, not come up the wall and stop short of actually going over it. Um, <laughs> So I hope that was helpful. The uh, second one, uh, second uh, example of a single and rest is here where we can use um, indirect composite. So it's made in a lab. So this is a reconstruct reconstruction case I did. Um, and you can see I, I put these nice horizontal platforms into there. So in a case like this, I, can, I, don't, I don't only get uh, tooth support from these molars, but rather I have maximized tooth support by getting Tooth support from all of these, you know, central incisors and canines, and because I've got support from so many teeth now, I can relieve the support from the palate and give it more of a horseshoe that you can see on the right-hand side. So, so really, the, the concept here is whenever you're doing any kind of indirect work on the tooth, um, think about how you can use it for other intentions as well. I mean, for instance, in this case. I'm sure I would have put um, uh, guide planes as well that are parallel amongst all of these just to give extra retention, which we'll come to later. Right, uh, another way is using uh, metal backings, gold, or this example was uh, nickel chromium. Again, another way of, of maximizing support. I mean, this, this patient, you know, if you're only going to use this, uh, this upper left uh, four and five, premolars for um, tooth support, you're going to be lacking tooth support uh, uh, around, the, uh, around the rest of the arch and you're going to need to get more support from the palate, which is okay, you can do that, but here was an opportunity for me to get more support from the teeth and these were robust, healthy teeth of good periodontal support, they could take it and therefore, um, and therefore again, allow me to maximize tooth support, which is um, the ideal, and to minimize the coverage of the palate, which normally you know, patients appreciate. <laughs> Um, next one is using crowns and bridges, uh, a few examples of porcelain infused to metal crowns and bridges and so on where, uh, uh, where, where uh, we've got additional um, you know, rest seats. And if you, if you look at this picture on top left side, um, you, can, you can see that, that there's a larger rest seat preparation here. This is in the laboratory when they made the crown. And that's obviously for the reason we mentioned earlier. They obviously realized it was just tight here. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, some of our students and dentists uh, asking you to speak slowly, slowly, please. There are a lot of people overseas listening to your presentation. Oh, sure, sure. And if you take your time, they are not specialists. Some of them are general dentists or just finally your graduate students. No problemo. Is, my, is the volume of my voice, voice volume, okay? Volume is very good. The clarity is very good. But just take it a little bit easy uh, on the, some of the, our young colleagues, please. No problemo. Um, I tell you what, once I was giving a talk uh, in, in Turkey uh, on this topic, it was actually this topic. Um, and it was really, <laughs> normally I gauge the response from the audience. And I tell you, there was a major language barrier because I just had blank faces all the way around. So I assume now there may be a lot of blank faces all over as well. Um, I've got another blue line across here, Shahab. I promise I didn't do that. I don't know if you've put that. It looks lovely though. Thank you very much. It's a piece of art. <laughs> okay, I don't know how it's getting there. Um, anyway, so, so what I've done here, I've, uh, this, these patients have required crown and bridge 
for many reasons, for whatever the reasons may be. But when I make these crowns and bridges, I try and make, uh, try and make maximum use of these crown and bridges for other intentions. For example, if I'm doing a crown, let's put some rest seats in there to get support. If I'm doing a crown, look at this. Someone's drawn a little heart for me. I don't know if that's, um, <laughs> I don't know who's doing this, but <laughs> I prefer if it's not. Um, now, now, if you look at this picture on the top right hand side, um, I've actually um, not only put rest, rest, uh, clues or rest seats here, but also guide planes. So measly and distally, the laboratory has used as used almost like a surveyor uh, to, to, to carve the wax so that the, it's dead parallel and the denture can slot right into this, right into this crown, right to this tooth, all the way around the mesial, distal and palatal. So we get guide planes, we get bulbosities for clasps, we get rest seats. Whenever you're doing a crown, do think about the tooth and think what I can do to maximize the use of this crown for the benefit of my denture. So I was coming back to this picture to say, why, why have I got a rest seat here with, which has become extended here? And that's because the minor connector needs to come off from this rest seat to join the major connector. Okay, which obviously the, the, I made the denture later, but when I was making the crown, the laboratory obviously realized that there's not enough space in the occlusion for the minor connector to come out of this rest seat and to attach to the major connector. So they had to make space. That's why they carved away a bit more porcelain. They have a thick metal there so that the metal can flow here and then go all the way down onto the major connector. Thank you for removing those annotations, whoever did so, appreciate it. Um, here is a three unit bridge. So there's the Pontic and there we have a single crown. Uh, and again, I thought, why not? This lady had very little teeth in anywhere else. We maximize tooth support by getting li nice large single and rests. I hope that's clear. Another way of getting tooth support, which I don't think anyone mentioned at the beginning, was overdenture abutments. Um, so here's one example of a case I did. This patient um, had these anterior teeth and uh, they had a poor prognosis, uh, not periodontally, they were just badly broken down. But rather than removing them and losing the tooth support, I actually decided we electively root canal treated them. And, uh, and we kept them there for tooth support. Um, and obviously having, having all that tooth support will give you some proprioception as well. Now when the anterior maxilla is loaded, when the patient is chewing, he gets a little bit more sensory feedback, which again, generally betters the quality of life rather than having the mucosa being loaded. Again, the mucosa is not gonna resorb either if we, if we have uh, over dendro abutments here rather than extracting them. And if these teeth are ever extracted in the future, not a problem. You can probably just locally reline the denture in that side. So in cases like this, uh, you know, they're healthy. I, I, I tend to keep them if possible. But I want you to notice something about this picture. And that is that I did trim these teeth down to the gingival level. Because if you leave, let's say there was a few more millimeters of tooth there. If you leave that and say, oh, I just smooth it. And the tooth is sticking out of the gum a little bit more then the laboratory doesn't have enough space for their denture components because you need some acrylic over there. You need some metal mesh, you know, the cobalt chrome mesh. Then you need a couple millimeters of acrylic on top of this and then the teeth. So if you've got big lumps of tooth sticking out of the gum, that's good. You're going to, the lab is going to lose their space to put their denture. So generally laboratories do like it for you to reduce the tooth as much as possible to maximize their space. In this case, I actually was opening the patient's bite. As you can see, if you look at the pictures, you can tell I've opened his bite up. If you look at those teeth on the right-hand side, you can tell I've opened his bite up. That, that way I get more space. But anyway, trimming the teeth down makes the, uh, gives the technician that additional space if they need it. Next picture, this is a precision attachment, so you can see. So this patient, again, not many teeth to support the denture. So we did the crown, again, with rest seats. Again, I use the crown, I, I put rest seats there. I put a bulbosity buckley so I can have a clasp engaging it. I made use of my crown. But also, these two teeth were supposed to be crowned as well. But unfortunately, when they were root treated, they ended up, as, there was so little tooth left there after all the caries was removed 
the endodontist got me in and he said, I'm sorry, these teeth are not restorable. And I said, don't worry, my friend, I'll make that decision. They are restorable. I'm going to use them as overdenture abutments with precision attachments. You can see a little bit sticking out of there, a little precision attachments, which engage onto retentive components inside the denture. So now we have a tripod of retention and support across the arch. We have the crown here, which is giving retention and support. We have a, and two precision attachments. These two teeth aren't really offering much, but they were okay, so I left them. But, but we have, even if these two teeth were lost, the main strategic teeth in this arch are these three uh, abutments. And as long as we have those teeth there, it's a very retentive denture. Uh, so again, it's thinking outside the box and not just leaving a root there if we need it. For example, on this patient's left-hand side, this is a very important retentive component. If we lose this tooth, we have nothing holding the denture in on this whole side. If we lose that tooth, it doesn't matter as much because we have this molar and we have, but really this is the critical one. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're maximizing use of the, uh, use of the retention. From the Moving on. Next picture is telescopic copings, which I don't think anyone mentioned. Now, this isn't my case. You can see I've, any, any case that has a person's name under it, it's a case I haven't done a, a, attributed to them, but all the other pictures are my cases. This picture on the right hand side is a clinical dental technician I work with. This patient had telescopic copings, which you can see, which are all milled parallel. Uh, in Germany and the patient now lives in the UK and wants the new denture. Uh, I don't do cases like this. I'm not an expert in cases like this. I'm just showing you this is another way to broaden our thinking ways of getting tooth support because these are all, the, all these teeth will provide tooth support for the denture and you can see what the denture looks like and actually when these telescopic copings are parallel and they're made parallel once that denture is in and these about these um uh, these teeth on the denture are sitting around these copings it's like a fixed appliance it's extremely retentive and actually quite difficult for the patient to put in and take out but it just again maximizes tooth support and minimizes the mucosal support so many many ways for us to think about when we're doing our partial denture cases to try and get tooth support right um, here we go, right, direct, direct retention. Again, this is preventing displacement away from the tissues and stopping your denture being lifted out. So over to you guys. I want you guys to think a little bit and tell me all the different ways that you can rack your brain to think of. How do we get direct retention for our partial dentures? So I want some, I want some answer, I want some people thinking and typing what they think, ways of getting Clasps, yep, absolutely. That's the primary way. Anything else that we've already mentioned? I mentioned a couple guide planes. Absolutely. If the guide planes are different to the path of withdrawal, then yes, guide planes will be undercuts and therefore um, in respect to the path of withdrawal and therefore um, uh, they, are, they can retain the denture. Precision attachments, exactly is what we mentioned. Anything else? Excuse me. So clasp, guide planes, implants, absolutely. Flange, yes, tissue undercuts, I think is what you're saying. Uh, swing lock, thank you very much for that contribution. <laughs> saliva, again, saliva, I, um, I, I'm not entirely sure. I think retent, saliva is more of an important component for complete dentures. Uh, I mean, they may contribute to partial, partials, I'm, I'm not entirely certain, but certainly uh, for complete dentures, that, that is definitely an important component. Fixative, absolutely. Um, Zubera, always love the contribution from you. <laughs> so yeah, uh, fixative if you're, if, if you're really stuck for choices, but I, I'm not gonna be discussing that too much. Um, uh, but essentially the, the points that have been made are, are accurate. So anything we've missed? No, I think everything's, everything's been mentioned, exactly. So an example of uh, the precision attachment. Uh, this case on the right-hand side it, it is not my case, but, but, but an interesting one. It's a prosthodontist uh, that worked in a practice before me um, at this case on the right. This is a really good way of getting yourself out of some trouble, I think, this, uh, this picture demonstrates, because we have a patient that's got, that requires those first molars for retention and support. And they've been crowned for whatever reason, I've, I don't know. Uh, and so he's cleverly incorporated a precision attachment in there, which you can see in the denture. And these plastic inserts generally come in different retentive, that the yellow is the least retentive, then you get orange and red. Depends which lab you work with, I'm just talking about my lab. But the interesting thing is here, some people with upper molars, you can see the clasps when they smile. 
And that really bothers some patients, understandably. Some people do have quite a wide smile and are not happy with the metal show. Perhaps this was a concern here, I don't know. But if it was, then uh, crowning these teeth, assuming they're indicated for crowns, and putting a precision attachment is a fantastic way, in my opinion, of um, removing the need of putting unsightly clasps. Because once that denture's there, you cannot see that metal. It's slotting into the yellow, uh, into the yellow sleeve here. Uh, and, and, it, and it provides very good retention. What I would say, though, it does reduce the prognosis of the teeth somewhat. Um, it, I do tend to find... Uh, teeth with precision attachments being periodontally less healthy and uh, caries as well. But you have to make a judgment. All this treatment planning is judgment. Shall we clasp it? Patients dead against it, but they want a retentive denture. So the discussion needs to be had. Perhaps this is the case for a precision attachment. An example of an implant retained partial denture here. Again, this patient has no teeth from one side to the other, only uh, a five and a six, a, a second premolar and a, and a first molar. That just gives retention on one side and the ten denture is always going to drop on the other side. So fortunately, he had the finances and the will to undergo implant surgery. Personally, I would have had an implant further, further back in this area, in the five or the six site. Trouble is, he had very pneumatized sinuses and there was no, there was no bone anywhere. And I'm not going to advocate lifting a sinus just to have a, a, an implant for, for, for a denture. But we had, we had some bone anteriorly and at least that gave enough to give him a tripod of retention and some additional support, uh, which he was quite happy with. And so, uh, again, different ways of getting ourselves out of tricky scenarios. Um, clasps, right, different materials for clasps. I won't ask you to type them all, I'll just go through them. So cast cobalt chrome tends to be the, um, the most commonly used cl uh, clasps for cobalt chrome dentures because it's cast into the framework. It's part of the wax up and it's cast as part of the framework. Um, and they work very well. What I wanna show you here, the picture that follows is an example of um, cast, um, cast cobalt chrome clasps. Um, now, I didn't make this denture. I did the reconstruction, but I didn't make the denture. So before anyone, any um, boffins in this group point out, hey, hang on a second, look at that. You've put a, a closely approaching clasp on a lower premolar. That's, that's, that's outrageous. I didn't advocate that. I wouldn't have done it myself. I would have done an RPI system. This picture's here for another reason, and that is for you to look at the clasp on that upper canine. Now, uh, there's a couple of things I want you to uh, acknowledge here. And one of them is that the clasp has been sandblasted. And, that, and generally, I, I, like us, I, I prefer to sandblast clasps that are in the aesthetic zone because assuming a patient will accept a clasp in the aesthetic zone, but sandblasting it just makes it a little less visible. It gets rid of that shine that you have, for example, this clasp at the bottom. You, that shine can show through sandblasting it mats it somewhat and just makes it that little bit less visible less catching to the eye a very simple thing your lab will do it obviously uh they don't sound the they don't sandblast the inside that bit is smooth it's just this portion the outside here the other thing i want you to notice is that it this clasp is tucked slightly more to the distal side of the undercut rather than mesially or buccally and that's because being tucked on the distal side of the canine just hides the clasp a little bit more from, from, the smart, from a smart shot. Again, obviously with a high smile line, you'll see this. These are just small techniques to try and make things less visible. Damage limitation, we say in the UK. Uh, the other type of clasp we can use is a stainless steel clasp. These are clasps that are not cast within the cobalt chrome flame framework, but rather they have been added uh, into the flange work. And this includes the divan clasp, if anyone has, has um, come across these. A divan clasp is a very discreet clasp, which is quite retentive, and it uh, stainless steel, as we mentioned. And the way it works is it runs along the flange, just runs along the flange and just tucks into that distal undercut, again, uh, of a tooth to make it less visible. Um, that's why these are quite popular. We can use gold. Gold is more flexible. Gold has better wear properties against enamel. So it, it, it's going to be kinder to the tooth. It will be kinder to composite as well. And so sometimes we may pick gold. It's, it's more flexible. I don't know if I mentioned that. And so therefore um, it, it's going to transmit less force onto the tooth if you're a little bit more concerned about it. 
again gold is added to the to, to the to the acrylic work you do have to be aware that whenever a laboratory adds gold they're going to charge you a little bit more and therefore um and therefore you just have to be prepared for that and, and cost that into your treatment planning tooth cutter class here's an example tooth cutter class sometimes we choose these when patients are a little bit concerned about the show personally i think these are horrible i don't like these at all i think they look like spaghetti or cheese in the mouth i personally don't add, I, I don't like doing them i've seen them i'm showing them for completeness Personally, if I'm going to do a clasp that has to be more discreet, I would probably choose a clear clasp. The indications are much the same. They cost the lab that I use will charge about 50 pounds for that. They are more likely to break as are the tooth cutter clasps, but, the, but, but they are, if, if made by a good lab and used in the right cases, they, they, they tend to work quite well and they don't break overnight. You know, they may after a couple of years. And this is what I've heard. I'm quite new to them. haven't got a great deal of experience. But again, there are lots of different clasps we can use. Someone's asked a question about using pink clasps. Um, I actually haven't heard of them. Um, so I, I can't really comment on them because I haven't heard of pink clasps before. Um, what is the material used uh, in tooth color clasp? It's some kind of polymer. I, I'm not entirely certain, to be honest. Um, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Uh, it's some, it's some uh, flexible polymer of some sort. Right. Um, can we just ask, are there any, I, I want to give you guys a little bit of breather. It's a little bit intense. Um, at this time in the evening, a lot of people can start dozing off when they hear people talking about partial dentures. And so if we do have any questions, uh, I'll just give a two minute uh, think if anyone wants to type any questions or, or if she have wants to unmute anyone to ask anything, I'm happy to answer before we move yeah, on yeah. to the next. Ivash, uh, may I just kindly, ask you to slow down a little bit with the remaining of your lecture please there are some people on the facebook from different countries asking you just to slow down slowly slowly if you don't mind please my apologies thank you my apologies and we'll put the questions at the end we will have like 10 15 minutes to wrap around all the questions to put them together in one shall session. we shall we move on then please but slowly slowly if you don't mind okay i'll go super slow okay <laughs> right indirect retention um, indirect retention is slightly different to direct retention uh, in that it's all about rotations. It's all about pivoting. I'm sorry, I can see lots of you asking questions. I'm really sorry. What I'll do is I'll come back to these at the end um, just because I've been asked to move on. I've been asked to slowly move on. <laughs> so I, I need to do that. Uh, but indirect retention is all about rotation. It's all about tipping. It's all about pivots. Okay. And think dentures tip and rotate about axes and the axis runs from one class sorry from one rest to another rest some people will say no no it's from one class to another class we can have that discussion another time for the set for, for now let's just say it's from rest to rest because that's what i firmly believe from one rest to another rest um now i want you guys just to quickly type if you've heard about indirect retention you're aware of it what are the ways you think uh, you can get this indirect retention, stopping dentures from rotating about, a, about an axis from one uh, uh, rest to another? How do you, there are a few ways. There's not many answers to this. Anterior rest, thank you very much. Class, fantastic. Someone said clasp there. And actually, uh, most people uh, don't mention clasps here because they don't realize that clasps, which are normally used for direct retention are actually fantastic for indirect retention as well. And we'll come to that in a moment. Major connector, um, absolutely. So, so soft tissue, the mucosa can also be used for indirect retention as well. So essentially rests, clasps, tissue support. A tissue support would be major connector. Uh, guide planes, perhaps, I'm not, I don't think about that. Let's look at this picture here. I'm not saying I would design my denture like this. This picture is here for us to understand the concept to make sure because indirect retention is something that a lot of people uh, struggle with and they, they don't understand it properly. And I'm just hoping that this picture will explain it a little bit more. Um, this picture shows that we have, forget these anterior rests for a moment, pretend they're not there. Look at this rest and this rest. We have two rests and we have free end saddles, no teeth at the back, just lots of denture teeth. So we have a axis of rotation about the rests. So from one rest to another, that will be the pivot 
or the fulcrum or the axis about which the denture will rotate. So if I'm chewing, let's say I'm biting on a sticky sweet and then I open my mouth, this, these teeth here are going to lift up. They're going to come away from the, the mucosa. They're going to lift away. They're going to lift up. But it's not actually just lifting up. It's actually rotating. And it's rotating about this axis. So everything behind this axis, so everything here, is going to be lifted up and out of the screen, which means everything in front is going to go in. If you have nothing stopping it going in, then that denture is going to lift up. So what we do, we put a rest seat here and we put a rest seat here. So you have a rest on both of these teeth, which means that when the denture wants to lift up and out of the page, and this part goes in, the denture stops by being in contact with these teeth. It's a complicated thing to get your head around. And normally in a presentation, I explain things with my hands flapping around the place and people understand it a bit better, but I hope that's clear. But what this happens, which the diagram doesn't show, when you put rests here, anteriorly you create new axes of rotation you create an axis here from this rest to this rest and another one from this rest to this rest so the denture is going to rotate in all different directions but let's now pretend there's a axis from here to here so everything behind this axis is going to come up and once it comes up that clasp will suddenly engage the tooth and when it engages the tooth, that's an example of a clasp being used for indirect retention. It is stopping that denture lifting up. And also, obviously, you've got the uh, rests doing their job as well. I hope that's clear. Right, RPI system. Lots of you will remember this concept, RPI system. Many of you would have forgotten what on earth it means. Uh, the R refers to the rest, which is a mesial rest. The I refers to a I bar or gingerly approaching clasp, and the P refers to a proximal plate along a guide plane distally. Now, um, this concept RPI system is all about torque. It's all about torsional forces on the tooth and preventing damage to the tooth. The RPI system is a concept that is recommended when you have free end saddles, when you have no teeth, and this is your this tooth here is your last abutment. Let's say that's a four, so you're missing your five, six, seven, eight. So that is your distal abutment. And how do you stop this distal abutment? How do you stop this tooth from having unfavorable forces that are going to cause it to become tra traumatized, you know, um, mobile through refusal trauma, uh, or, or, or even worst case scenario, extracted? Um, because there's just so much force in the tooth. This concept, again, we have to look at the concept of um, this whole rotation. So if we look at this picture here, RPI system, you've got a clasp that's mesial. So imagine someone's chewing here and they bite down. They're biting into these teeth. Everything is now going to rotate, like we said, about the rest. This is what's going on. So now when we bite down, the denture moves down, doesn't it? It goes down, but it's not actually going down. It's actually rotating. It's rotating. It's going down, but actually laterally a little bit about this pivot, which means everything mesial to this is actually not going down. It's going up because it's a rotation. You can see my cursor going. So everything in front is going up and everything behind is going down. In this concept, with RPI, you have your rest seat that's slightly distal to, sorry, you have your clasp slightly distal to this rest seat. That's important because when he bites down, everything distal to this will move down, which means this clasp comes down. And if the clasp comes down, it lets go of the tooth. So it, it lets go of the tooth. And then you have a little plate here that's holding the tooth and stopping the tooth moving distally as well. So it's bracing and holding the tooth together. Now let's go to the opposite of RPI to make the point further. The opposite of RPI is this blasted scenario. Now in this scenario, you have the opposite. You don't have a mesial rest seat, you've got a distal rest seat. You don't have an eye bar, you have a rigid, firm, 
a closely approaching clasp. And the closely approaching clasp is on the other side of the pivot to the teeth. So now let's look what happens here. Patient bites down. Everything, now everything's rotating about this distal rest. So firstly, patient bites down. There's some force on this tooth from the rest. This tooth is, on this side of the tooth, is pushed down, pushed down. Now, everything in front of this rest, its rotation, everything in front of the rest is going up. So what does this clasp do? Is it letting go? No, I hear you say. This clasp doesn't let go. If everything behind here goes down, everything in front of this rest seat, rest is gonna go up. Suddenly this clasp doesn't let go, it engages the tooth. So we have on this tooth, this distal abutment, we have the distal side of this tooth being pushed down and the mesial side of this tooth being pushed up. That's called torsion. That creates a torque force on the tooth and actually causes it to become mobile. And I mean, I've even seen a picture from a lecture where they showed a, a case like this where the denture's out and the tooth is in there as well. It's actually taken the tooth out. Um, and so this picture kind of makes the point that RPI works to prevent. When it's in function, when you're biting, this, in this scenario, the clasp engages and that's problematic. In the previous RPI scenario, the clasp lets go and also braces the tooth at the back to stop it from moving distally. Whereas here, the tooth can move distally because there's nothing stopping it from moving distally. I hope that makes sense. Again, another indirect retention and uh, RPI system is not generally a topic I like to deliver at 9.15 at night, <laughs> uh, but uh, when, after a whole day with the kids. But anyway, I hope the concept has, um, has, ha makes a little bit more sense. Right, um, bracing and reciprocation. Again, another topic that develops on confusion. Um, what's the difference? Uh, the difference really is more semantics. Uh, actually, sorry, no, I, I shouldn't have said that. It's not semantics. The, 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 the difference is the concept of reciprocation is probably what most of us think about when we think about bracing. And we'll come to reciprocation in a second. Bracing is when the denture is fully seating in place. It's not being moved, it's not, it's not moving, it's not being lifted up, being removed by the patient. It's when the denture's fully seating in place and it's movements in the horizontal plane. So the denture being moved left or right, forward and back, not up and down. Up and down is reciprocation or more up is reciprocation, down is support. Racing is when the denture's sitting, what stops the denture sliding left and right? And to be honest, anytime you design a denture, you're pretty much gonna have bracing by default, it will just happen. If you've got a major connector, you're gonna have bracing. If you've got some rests on some teeth and some lingual coverage on other teeth, you will have bracing. So I don't wanna to spend too much time discussing that because most of us will put bracing into our dentures without even knowing it. The concept I really wanna to touch on is the concept of reciprocation. And reciprocation is, that's why I've got the pictures. So these pictures show reciprocation, not bracing. They're talking about reciprocation. Reciprocation is when the denture is being moved up. So the denture's in function and is coming out of the mouth of the patient trying to get it out of the mouth. If we look at the first picture on the left, the picture number one, okay, you can see a clasp that's engaging an undercut and the clasp is being moved up as the denture moves up. Um, there's nothing lingually on that tooth. There's nothing reciprocating it. There's nothing on the other side of that tooth. So you have this metal clasp that's engaging an undercut. The denture is now being pulled up and out of the mouth and that clasp is gonna move up like the arrow is showing. One of two things is gonna happen. Either the clasp is gonna flex, it's gonna move, or the tooth is gonna move. There's no third option. One of, one of the two is gonna happen. Either the clasp will move or the tooth will move. In this picture, number one, someone quickly reply, when the denture is moving up, what's gonna move? Someone quickly just types what you think. Tooth, 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 yes, yeah, that, that's it. You have nothing holding the tooth, yeah, tooth, someone has written. <laughs> yeah, quite right, I'm glad everyone has, has agreed to that because that's exactly what will happen. The tooth will move. That's not a good thing. We don't want the tooth to move. So what we do is we hold the tooth on the other side. Go now to picture number two. Now you have another arm holding the tooth on the other side. So now you have a metal arm in contact with the tooth, 
rigidly holding it in place and the clasp on the other side. Now, when the denture is moving up, the tooth ain't gonna move. If the tooth isn't gonna move, what's gonna move? Someone type, type, type. Clasp, absolutely, thank you very much. So one of the two is gonna have to move. We don't want the tooth doing the work. We want the denture doing the work. The clasp is engaging an undercut and that clasp is designed to flex in order to let the, let the denture come out of the mouth. We want the clasp to flex. So whenever we put a, a, a clasp on one side, we have to reciprocate it or brace it, if you like, to use the more colloquial term. We have to hold it on the other side. So we can do that in two ways. We can do that with a, um, with a reciprocating arm, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, or we can do it with a plate. Now, let's, let me explain which of the two I prefer and why. Let's look at picture number four. In picture number four, the reciprocating arm has been put in the wrong place. And I'm sure this happens most of the time. Because in order for the reciprocating arm to work, to hold the tooth, that reciprocating arm, this bit here, oh, oh sorry, let's move back, or this one here, reciprocate, has to be in contact with the tooth the whole time. The moment that reciprocating arm let, releases from the tooth, the tooth is not being held anymore. So what's gonna move? The tooth. The clasp is not gonna, it's not gonna flex. The clasp is rigid metal. It's not gonna move unless it's forced to move. The PDL is like a waterbed, it will move. So the tooth will move. The PDL, I mean periodontal ligament, is like a waterbed. The periodontal ligament's not as rigid as the, um, as the clasp. Therefore, the clasp will move the tooth. So the reciprocating arm must be in contact with the tooth for that whole time that this clasp, if you look at the picture, this clasp is in contact with the tooth from, let's say the survey line is here, the clasp is in contact for this whole period, the reciprocating arm has to be in contact with this whole period. That's not easy to achieve. And the reason that's not easy to achieve is because you have other bulbosities on the other side. So strictly speaking, you should prepare a guide plane. And I don't know how you do that accurately, to be certain that that guide plane is exactly in the right place that the reciprocating arm uh, will be, needs to be in contact with the tooth while the clasp is. It's quite difficult to do that. Uh, uh, but, but theoretically, in a crown, you can, the lab can design that. But in a tooth, if you don't prepare a guide plane in the right place, you probably end up in a scenario like this, that at some point, as the clasp is moving up, the reciprocating arm will let go and that tooth will move. So my personal preference, and I understand there are debates, people will disagree with this. This is my personal preference, uh, and there are arguments for and against, is to use a plate. Because frankly, there's not much thinking about that. The plate will be in contact with the tooth the whole time that that denture moves up. And so not all the time, not all the time, not all the time, <laughs> let me just say that before I'm fired down, most of the time, I would favor having the cobalt chrome covering the lingual surface of the tooth that's being clasped. Because I'm certain then that that tooth is going to be reciprocated and held firm properly and that tooth is not going to be compromised. So if we look at this denture I presented you to you earlier, we have clasp here and I put a reciprocating plate here. I don't have a reciprocating arm. I have a clasp here and a reciprocating plate. That's my personal preference. I totally respect and understand that there will be differences. And I've done many reciprocating arms before uh, instead of plates, uh, this style. Uh, but I favor it if I'm doing a crown because I know that the lab will design uh, uh, the shape of the crown to make sure that reciprocating an arm is in, is in contact the whole time. Right, we're coming to an end now. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, I'm going to start wrapping up by giving you all some general guidelines tips you know um rules if you like of denture design these aren't hard and fast these won't work in every case but they are general principles to just have in mind when you're designing dentures chrome dentures so first one is having rests adjacent to the bounded saddle let's say we have a first premolar sorry, let's say we have a um, second premolar and a first molar missing, a five and a six. So that's a bounded saddle. 
That means our adjacent abutments are going to be the four, the first premolar, and the seven. The four and the seven. So we tend to put rests as a guideline, as a tip, put the rest as close as possible to the saddle. So on the four, the rest will go distal. And on the seven, the rest will go mesial. Of course, you can put a distal rest on the seven as well. You can do both. But as a general tip, we put the rests as close as possible to the saddle to minimize the force on the mucosa and make sure the tooth takes that, for, uh, takes that load. For free end saddles, for distal extension saddles, we tend to use an RPI system. We don't have to in every case. There are, we can vary the RPI system and we can make changes, but for the purposes of this brief webinar, uh, as a principle, try and use the RPI system. Uh, where, uh, where possible in free end saddles. Generally, for a cobalt chrome denture, we like to have three rests and three clasps. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But generally, think of three as being the magic number that that is my guiding number. So if, for example, I can only get two clasps, then think of another way of trying to get retention, be it through a guide plane or, or something else. Um, Two rests, two two um, two clasps will work. Of course, one clasp can work. But as a principle, three is a good number. Three is a good number of uh, rests and a good number of clasps to think about. When we want to relieve the gingiva, so we want a more hygienic denture, and we need the 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 the, the a window to be developed where the the chrome comes away from the tooth. We need to make sure it's three millimeters. And the reason for that is. If it's less than three millimeters, that's where your chrome is coming away from the tooth. To, you want to make it more hygienic. If it's less than three millimeters, it tends to be a food pack and it's an area for food to get stuck into. And it also tends to be um, something that bothers the patient. The patient's, if it's a one or two millimeter, the patient's tongue tends to gravitate and try and lick it and it, it tends to annoy them. Three millimeters is large enough that it will not pack food and it will it will cleanse itself by nature. The saliva will clear the area itself, a uh, minimum three millimeters, by the way. Uh, and, and also it won't be a, it won't irritate the patient. So that's another guide. We, as cast your mind back to the beginning of the presentation, as a tip, we tend to use a composite where possible uh, instead of preparing teeth. So if we're doing single limb rests, I don't want to drill a little indentation into that lower canine. I'll tend to use composite instead. Um, well, for molars, uh, we, we tend to use cast occlusally approaching clasps. And for premolars, we tend to use gingerly approaching clasps. The reason for that is for a premolar, if you have an occlusally approaching clasp, which is cobalt chrome, it's too short. And if it's too short, it's going to be too rigid and it's not going to flex. Remember, for a clasp, a clasp is engaging an undercut. Therefore, a clasp needs to flex and come away from that undercut when the denture is being taken out of the mouth. So if, it, it, if the clasp is too rigid, it won't flex and there'll be too much force on the tooth or the tooth or the denture will be far too retentive. And therefore we need a longer clasp for premolars. So we use a gingerly approaching clasp. It will be longer. And so because it's longer, it's going to be more flexible. And alternatives are using gold or stainless steel for gingerly approaching clasps. At the end, take a, you know, take a step back, look at your denture that you've drawn down on a sheet of paper and, and, and just, just consider it. Is it simple? Is it hygienic? Is, has it been over-engineered? Sometimes we do tend to over-engineer our, our dentures. We make them too complicated. And it's a patient who has no idea of dentistry, no appreciation to the finesse and the skill and so on. And, and therefore we need to have a denture that fulfills the principles but at the same time is acceptable to them and so if we make a complicated path of insertion or, or, or too much retention three clasps and you know four clasps even and two implants and two precision attachments it, it's too much retention so we just have to look at it as a neutral observer have i over engineered this is it too complicated can i make it simpler Right, wrapping up now, sorry, a couple slides just to end it. And that is a note on impression making. Um, this is something that um, a lot of people um, have questions over and I thought it's worth adding this uh, to the end. 
my believe it or not i am a specialist prosthodontist and it might shock many of you that my that my material of choice for chrome despite a, a silicone impression being showed here my material of choice is actually alginate now here is where uh, shihab decides to bar me from any webinars in the future how dare you use uh, alginate but hold on hold on let me discuss <laughs> um there are various materials you can use uh, for cobalt for cobalt chrome dentures and i've written the materials that i think are um the, the main materials that most people would be would be using across the world and that is addition cured silicone so that's an example of one you can see here as a, a, a monophase use of a light body to capture some additional detail um or you can just use the monophase just a medium viscosity silicone by itself that's why it's called monophase because you only need one phase but i i like the addition of having a light body there as well polyether which is another monophase uh, or alginate now the reason i prefer alginate and i've done many many silicone impressions and i continue to do it but the the reason why i prefer alginate is because a chrome requires a very accurate impression you cannot have any drags. You have to capture everything because it is something made out of metal, which is not going to be easy to adjust. And that metal is going to be fitting against something else, which is rock solid, which is either metal, porcelain, or tooth. There's very little give in the system. And therefore, um, you, you want the impression to be as flawless as possible. Using silicone for an impression material is fantastic it has the best accuracy and the dimensional stability however it does suffer the issue of being very technique sensitive it is very difficult in my opinion to get it and i've done plenty of these and you can see there's no drags on this impression but it is i do acknowledge it is difficult to get a uh, a good really good drag free impression of a lower arch for example in silicone because when you do a crown prep, you dry the tooth, you're just focusing on one tooth. You can easily dry that tooth and control it. But in a mouth like this that you can see, it's very difficult to make sure all parts of the mouth and all gingival margins are clean and no saliva comes up. It's quite difficult to get a good impression and you can easily go you know, floor with your impression and you've got a big drag on the wrong tooth and you have to do your impression again. Polyether, to be honest, it's there. I, I personally don't use it. I don't have experience in it. I've really used it once or two times. So if you like to use it, fine. I know it sets very rigid. Therefore, we shouldn't use it where there's large undercuts. And we shouldn't use it in periodontally involved teeth because it, it can actually uh, you know, remove the teeth if they're mobile. Um, but, so I tend to use either silicone or alginate. But the reason I prefer alginate uh, is because um, it, it's a much easier material to use you can get a very, alginate is a very accurate material and you can get a very good quality impression. It all depends on how you then treat your alginate. From mixing, to taking the impression, to removing it, to, 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 to storing it in transit, disinfecting and storing it, packaging it properly. There are many steps where if alginate isn't treated with respect, you get poor quality impression. Therefore, if you're aware of all these limitations, you can get a very accurate impression. And one of the main advantages is that it's hydrophilic. If it's hydrophilic, your risk of getting these drags uh, with silicone, which is very common, is, is, is much reduced. You, 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 know, you can get a much better quality impression. A bit of saliva comes, it won't ruin your impression, but it will with, with, with silicone. Now, I tend to prefer Zermac as a brand. I think it's a fantastic brand. And they have two, uh, they have many alginates, but two that I would consider using. The first one is Hydrogum 5, and the second one is Neocolloid. Neocolloid is, they claim, the, their most accurate impression. They're, they're, sorry, their most accurate alginate. So if, if you have a lab on site that can pour your impression straight away, and remember, this is one of the important things about alginate, it's not dimensionally stable, and therefore, one of the parts of treating your alginate with respect is knowing that it has to be poured up quickly. So if it's going to go, uh, you know, three days in postage to China, it's probably not the best material to use. But if you have a lab on site that, um, that's going to pour up your impression quickly, neocolloid is probably your best material. It's your most, their most accurate alginate, and it's going to be poured straight away, so there's not going to be any time for it to distort. 
However, not, not all of us can use neocolloid. Not all of us have a lab on site. Some of us, the lab, many of us, most of us, the lab will pick up the impression and they will take it to the lab and it'll be poured up several hours later. Or some of you will post it and it'll be delivered next day to the lab. So there'll be a long time. In these cases, so for most of us, I would suggest using hydrogen 5. They claim, in my opinion, wrongly, hydrogen 5 is a alginate which is stable dimensionally for five days. I think that's absolute nonsense. I can't see any alginate being stable for five days. Uh, there is one study I found done in Iran, um, and uh, no bias, I'm Iranian myself, but <laughs> the lots of dental research comes from Iran. And one, I did find one paper where they looked at the dimensional stability of dyes or, or, or uh, you know, master casts made with hydrogen 5 and what happens when the alginate is left for a day, two days, and so on. And um, the, uh, the hydrogen 5 seemed to be very stable for about 24 hours. But that is on the, so, so that 24 hours means if you send it in the post next day delivery, that's probably okay. If you take your impression in the afternoon, next day delivery and the lab pours up in the morning, I think that's absolutely fine. I've done it plenty of times and I scrutinize my fit. And I'm telling you, my chromes fit very nicely or I take the impression again. Most of the time, if it's post and it's even poured up within 24 hours, it's very accurate. However, don't just stop listening now. It has to be treated with respect. And the way you need to treat the alginate, hydrogen 5 has its own mixing, its own water measure. You have to have the right water measure. You have to have the right scoop, the ones that the manufacturer provides. That's the first thing. Has to be mixed in the right proportions, therefore. Then, uh, once the impression is taken uh, and removed from the mouth, disinfected, don't cover it with soggy tissue. The way you, you store your alginate for transit, you rinse it under the tap, and then you have the alginate, you have the impression, you just get one sheet of gauze, just one, damp it, and just lay it over your impression. That's it. You then put it in a sealable bag, completely sealed, remove all the air from the bag. This is important. So you, uh, you, you put one sheet of damp gauze and you seal it, you remove the air from one of these sealable bags and you seal it completely. Because in that scenario, your alginate would, would not distort so quickly, especially the hydrogen 5, because it's the humidity in that air inside the bag that maintains the stability of the alginate. And if you don't treat it with that respect, for sure, your alginate will not, will not be a reliable impression. Sorry that went on a little bit, but it, it's an important thing, I think, to pick up because most of us on this group listening probably do use alginates. So I want to be a little bit realistic as well. Okay, a couple of applications to real life. I'll whiz through these quickly because of time. Um, to survey or not survey. Um, I think surveying, I, as a prosthodontist, I tend to, to do it a lot. I do acknowledge that most of us on this group do not survey our casts. I will say, if you survey, then you have complete control over your case. You know what class will fit where, what's going to work, where your guide planes are. You're not relying on anyone except for your own skill. And that is the gold standard. I used to survey all my cases and plan them in that way because I thought if I'm not going to do it as a prosthodontist, then, you know, what kind of a prosthodontist am I? And so I, and so I did it. I don't do it now. And the reason I don't do it now is because I work in a practice that has an on-site laboratory with a clinical dental technician and I work alongside him. So I, I have my impression, I have my uh, cast, I have my design and we can discuss it. So it, it, it's a little bit different. Otherwise I would probably favor surveying so that I know, um, whether or not it's possible or not. Um, someone just asked uh, for me to repeat that tip about the alginate, um, how to store it. So mix it correctly according to the right alginate scoop and water scoop. Use the ones that the manufacturer gives you, not the other one of a different brand that's lying around. You have to use the alginate liquid, sorry, the alginate water measure and scoop that comes with that brand. Once you mix it correctly, um, I'm assuming you take your impression correctly and so on, you leave in the disinfectant for five, 10 minutes, and then you take it out, rinse it under the tap, and don't have your alginate soaking in water. Just rinse it under the tap so there's a bit of water over it. Then you put a single layer of gauze that's damp in water over the top, put it into these one of the sealing bags, take all the air out of the bag, just gently you know, squeeze the bag together so the air comes out and seal it completely because it's the humidity that will preserve that, preserve the, the, the stability of the alginate. Moving on, prognosis of remaining teeth. When you design a dent, you have to be aware of the prognosis of the teeth. I would suggest, if I take us a few slides back, 
let's say for example this scenario here let's say just for example this tooth has a bad prognosis and i think that tooth's going to be lost or any one of these teeth it could be it could even be the central incisor plan for failure by putting letting your chrome reach to, to the back of that tooth so if you ever lost that tooth in the future the patient doesn't need a new chrome you can, as long as your chrome extends there a lab can add a tooth to it okay it's not as great as adding to acrylic but it's possible so if you have a tooth with a dubious prognosis i would make sure my chrome extends to that tooth to make sure you can add to it for the future that's basically what i mean by pl pro planning uh, the, the, uh, being aware of the prognosis of the remaining teeth and, and, and planning for failure um aesthetics so look at this picture here this bottom right hand side you can see there's a gold clasp here this patient had no teeth from upper left one all the way to the back he had no teeth on the left hand side he only had his upper right one and two and i think he had an upper right six so for you know rightly or wrongly i put a gold. i needed some kind of retention so i put a gold clasp here i use gold um divan style if you can well you can't see it very clearly here i use gold because i thought gold is going to be a bit less visible than uh than, than cast cobalt chrome but obviously this is a risk and i had to explain this to the patient before and he was he didn't mind actually but you know lots of people are not going to accept this and i wouldn't do this in the future this would be a perfect scenario where we can crown this upper right one this is a full composite build-up by the way there's that's not a natural tooth there's hardly any tooth there it was a very large composite build-up so it probably needs a you know it could benefit from a crown perfect case to put a precision attachment uh coming out of this tooth which the denture would engage in that way you get very nice retention true it puts this tooth at a bit of risk but we're trying to hide this potentially unacceptable clasps showing and so and that's a nice example of a case for precision attachment advantages of milled crowns and bridges we've discussed that use your crowns and bridges put rest seats on them bulbosities so that you can get uh, you know on the buckle aspect so you can get retention for your clasps rest seats guide planes there's so much you can do with your crown and bridge make use of them and conform or reorganize i mean a case like this that you see here I'm opening his bite, I'm changing his occlusion, you have to reorganize. Um, it's a big discussion whether you conform or reorganize. As a simple principle in a single webinar that I could just leave you with, if at the end of treatment, there's gonna be lots of original teeth that are still contacting and interdigitating, let's say you've got a couple molars and premolars on one side and maybe one or two premolars and molars on the other side contacting, you can probably conform. This is just a simple you know, general principle. But if in a case like this, I mean, you've only got anterior teeth, I'm opening his bite, I'm doing composite buildups, and you know, I'm completely changing his parameters. Any case like that, then that, that very few teeth will be in contact, original tooth surfaces will be in contact, then you have to reorganize in, in, in centric relation. I hope that's clear as a general principle in plants we've discussed. Thank you. I'm do sorry I went over time. Um, but uh, I hope you benefited and uh, I, I welcome any questions. My details are here, practices I work in, my email. Uh, and, and I hope I didn't go um, you know, too fast for, for most of you. Thank you very much, Sivaj. Very interesting talk, uh, excellent presentation. I'm very grateful for the time and the efforts you put to put this presentation together. We have got overwhelming, uh, I think, um, number of questions. I don't think we'll be able to go through all, but I'll just pick up a couple of questions, technical ones, and one bit much like strategic question, and probably going to be a food for thought for the future for another webinar or a talk by one of our colleagues or yourself. Uh, I've got a question coming from one of our uh, attendees uh, asking about the telescopic crowns and whether you prefer that over precision attachments in terms of retention. What's your thought on that? Uh, as I mentioned with telescopic crowns, I'm, I, I'm, I don't have a great deal of experience in them uh, and I was showing them more for the purpose of uh, you know, being holistic in my presentation. Um, but you, in order to maximize retention, you need a few teeth with telescopic crowns. However, with precision attachments, a single one will give you um, a single one that doesn't look like me. Um, that picture. No, this is for tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I need my presentation up if you don't. I might have to go through the slides. Is that is that okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah because yeah. some of the questions might. Do I just press share screen? Yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Just because I might have. No, it's okay. Just in case I, I need to mention something for my presentation. Sorry, wh where was I? Um, 
I forgot what inverse I was crowns and precision attachment. Yes, but a single precision attachment to, will give you retention. So that, that's my, I, I favor precision attachment because I've been doing, I've done more of them, more experience with them. And that's my understanding between when you'll pick one or the other. You do need a fair bit of uh, restorative space, I would imagine, uh, uh, with, um, uh, okay. with telescopic crowns. But I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. No, that's good. I think that's uh, it's good uh, for the time being. Um, another question coming about uh, from one of our colleagues talking about the uh, rest location. Does it have to be perpendicular to the axis of rotation? Uh, uh, oh, oh, you mean for, uh, I'm assuming you mean for indirect retention. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, talking here, the question about the rest seats, whether it has to be the axis of rotation. Uh, yeah, it should be like, I it think. must be in the, yeah. yeah. So, so, so if we go back, if we go back to that, um, let's go back to that slide. So, so, so indirect retention is all about, it's, it's all about preventing rotation. Okay, that's what it's about. And therefore, any axis you have between one rest and another rest, any line you can draw between any rest is going to be an axis about which it rotates. Yeah. And therefore, the, the way you will get the best um, indirect retainer is a rest seat that is as far away as possible from that, uh, uh, from that, um, axis of rotation. Yeah, it's from the axis of rotation. So for instance, just theory, I wouldn't do this. I, I, I would do, probably do them on canines, but just to make the point, the best place, uh, um, theoretically, not practically, theoretically, the best place to put an indirect retainer to prevent this axis that I'm pointing out here would be on these two, uh, centrals, uh, for example, yeah. I mean, they're put on canines because canines are more robust. Uh, right. Um, and less likely to cause trauma uh, to, to the central, but, 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 but theoretically that as, that's as far away as you get and that will give you the maximum uh, indirect retention. But for practicality purposes, we'll prefer the canines. Thanks, Sivash. Uh, another question, I think is coming, um, uh, with regard to the composite buildups and opening space or inter-occlusive space for, for whether fixed or removable stations, would you be happy to put a, Cobalt chrome uh, framework against a composite uh, buildups, especially on the lower anterior teeth or the upper anterior teeth, but later. Oh, I, I see. I see what you're saying. Um, the the issue. Uh, um, do I have a picture? I'm not sure if I have a picture that would show that. But anyway, let's look at this case. Yeah. Because this patient did. did direct frustrations. I'm talking about direct frustrations, especially with tooth yes. work. So this is the upper arch. Opposing this upper arch was was exactly what you say was composite buildups lower canine to canine, yeah. um, and so these these composites um, I can't remember in this case, but these it may have been occluding because these were di these were composite backings I put there. But I I would imagine in most cases I would actually get the composite to contact the tooth and not let the chrome cover as much of the of the palatal surface i'm pretty certain that's what i did in this case i planned it so, such that if you look at this picture here the lower end the chrome is coming up here stopping yeah. there and the lower end size is touching the composite backing so you've got a like for like yeah. if i've got no choice and i do have this scenario sometimes where composite will be touching the chrome and i can't avoid it then so be it we know that chromes that sorry that the chrome will wear the composite buildups a little bit faster yeah. um, but I mean, realistically, composite doesn't isn't going to last forever. It will wear down if you if you can't right. avoid it, and, and you have no choice. Then you know, so be it. I think that most of us will do the same unless you have some resource to uh, do some extra coronal restoration, indirect restorations, and the interface will be more accurate in terms of contact and in terms of the yeah. durability as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think that's all from uh, us today. Thank you very much, Sivash. Is Wow, it's a great presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly, actually. It's refreshed my memories and minds about partial dentures, the practice of partial dentures, the principles of partial dentures. And I think uh, congratulations, um, Sivas. You covered it uh, very nicely and thoroughly and you were, I would say, thorough on every single point. But I think we need to get back again to have another probably talk or webinar on the interface between partial dentures and uh, predominantly involve patients or um, uh, 
probably people being treated uh, on uh, for periodontitis and also the interface between fix and removal prosthesis at some stage if that's okay with you sure sure absolutely thank you very thank much for having me much, and hopefully we will um, look forward to seeing you sometime soon at the London Dental Academy before we go guys just remind you tomorrow at 6 30 UK time uh, we have another speaker Dr. Amar Al Horani, who is a specialist endodontist, will be talking to us about the endodontic irrigations, uh, tips uh, for um, uh, safe and effective endodontic uh, irrigation, top tips for GDPs. He will be talking about the techniques used in irrigation, the concentration, the method being used, the complications might happen, how to prevent. Uh, sodium hypochlorite accidents and what are the latest in terms of evidence of the best available irrigant in uh, endodontics. So please do join us. We'll be live on Facebook and also uh, will be, uh, I think the uh, Zoom webinar ID will be on the poster which will be posted on the Facebook and Instagram. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining us. All the best.